Just as products today are, you know, big data tells people who their users are down to how they're watching it, who this person is, their age demographics, income, all that. Uh, how much should someone know their audience for their film? Like, how much should they really study and shrink it down? Oh, it's going to be a person in this age range, this income bracket, watching it on their home television set. It's going to be at the holidays. The, the, the truth to that, and it's great that you're bringing that up, is that's not a, like a newbie writer or a newbie producer uh, and a hopeful director. That's in truth, that's the component they don't have to worry about as much. That is where it falls more into my role or our role in the distribution world. Um, we know those answers. We know the audience that we're selling to. We're not, we're not directly selling to an audience audience, people actually buying the movie at a, you know, on iTunes. We're selling to the company in between that's placing that movie there, that's making it available to audiences. They tell us what we need, and then we kind of create content that's going to deliver to that and through that source. Um, a television channel is that. It's a platform that reaches audience. They know what their audience likes. They know all the metrics and details of that audience. They tell us what they need. So we know what's needed. What we need from a writer is to know, can they write? Are they reliable? Can they hit the genre conventions well? Um, the reason I talk about the goldmine genres and writing for the green light and then also the television chapter is it's a great way of saying, look, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to overthink it. Hit these buckets. Focus on these types of genres. And even if you make mistakes, even if there's uh, uh, novice errors, like you know, slight inconsistencies or maybe a typo, it's going to be OK. Because w there's so few people who write that kind of stuff, the stuff that Hollywood truly needs. So you know, m metricing out whether the lead female is 42 or 47 is meaningless in a way. It's, it's all right, middle-aged woman. That's all we need to know. Woman in Peril Thriller, got it. Are you hitting the genre conventions? Great. We're not going to buy that script. We're going to hire your services as a writer to write the script we do need, where we've already figured out all that stuff, and we'll let you know about it. That's how it really works. So for an individual writer, for an individual filmmaker, don't sweat that stuff. That is the component of the business that you truly can say, I'll let other people worry about that because they're going to be informing me what I need. But first, you got to get over that hurdle of how are you going to have that relationship? And to get there, focus on the goldmine genres, build that relationship, get noticed, then the steps will follow. That's a great point. You said that, that they actually do need to worry about because I think there's a misconception that a lot of people, oh, when I get to this level, I won't have to worry about that. But then it's, it's the chicken before the egg type of thing. Well, at what point are you going to be at that level? So what are some things that people really do need to pay attention to to launch their career or to get their work seen that they think they don't? Uh, to be mindful of where their role fits into the total landscape of the business. Um, you know, uh, in distribution, in, in the media business in general, um, it, it's really, we're following the lead of an audience. Audiences tell us what they want. And we just have the skill sets, the connections, and the ability to hear that, find the content that's going to work, or find a way to create it, and then find the people who can help us create it, and then package it and get it out to people. You know, that's what distribution is. And uh, for people who are trying to kind of cross that first hurdle in their career, the thing, they, they need to be very cognizant of that and they need to be very understanding that, yes, filmmaking is an art, but it is a business before it's an art. It, Thomas Edison did not invent the film camera uh, just because it was going to open the pathways to creating great stories. He did it as a way to sell a product and to sell visual images that people would buy. Edward Moybridge, who created series photography, there's a reason all the, the, the characters in his work are nude, because they needed to sell the imagery. They needed to sell the package. Uh, and in fact, the, the famous horse that was running and all four legs were up at the same time, it was a bet uh, as to whether that actually existed. So I mean, the first movie, which was Edward Moybridge's 
running horse, I don't know what it's called. Uh, uh, it was a transacted, produce this for us so we can win a bet. That's how media works. It's here's the audience, here's the money, produce something so it fits this and we can continue that process going that assembly line. It's very easy to criticize the assembly line when you're on the creative side, when you're new to it. You know, I don't want to sell out. I don't want to just make frivolous junk. I get it. Um, but there is a great common ground in the middle there where there's an audience who wants certain kinds of content and there are distribution companies willing to pay for it and help put the financing together and we need creative people to jump in and make it happen. And there are amazing movies that are very, very genre oriented uh, that, that are, are great stories, meaningful, and have surpassed time in terms of, you know, people still reference them and go back to them and rewatch them. And they're very, very, very commercial products. Uh, so, you know, it's a business first. It, it, films would not get funded if there wasn't money to pay for it. And people wouldn't be investing in movies if there wasn't a profit to be made on the back end. Very few, very few. I thought that was great that you said that criticize the assembly line because we do get a lot of comments on our videos about that and not just the, the one that you did about your book, but you know, people that criticize the, the comic book uh, franchise and things like that. But the thing is, is that it's there for a reason. And I'm not saying that I'm a total fan of that genre by any means, and I get what they're saying. But I think it's a lot of times hard for a lot of artists to accept that because they are artists. They don't want to write just something that's going to sell. And it's, it's finding that balance. You know, we still need to get a job even though we may not like doing certain things. We still need to bring in some kind of income. So it's an interesting debate. The, I mean, look, the greatest works of art in history, go to Europe and go to some museums, the Renaissance, it's commissioned work. Michelangelo was a commissioned artist. You know, the Sistine Chapel was not a vision he had. He was hired to produce it. He took his talent and his initiative to bring life to it and to make it a masterpiece. But he was hired to, hey, we got the ceiling and we don't know what to do with it. So, you know, you came recommended to us. You know, so it's, it, that's how it works. And that's, that's been art from the beginning. <clears throat> Great expectations. This giant book we all had to read in high school. The reason it's so giant is because Charles Dickens had uh, a whole family with dozens of kids that he needed to feed, and he was being hired every two weeks to keep an, a, an attentive audience entertained. So he said, all right, I'm going to keep this story going because I'm making money doing it. And he was being paid by the magazine because the magazine had an audience willing to pay for it to keep it going. Uh, the money comes first. If there's not money there, if there's not something to be transacted upon and a profit to be made, there is no art. There's nothing to be created because no one's going to pay for it uh, except a couple of wacky people who are willing to sink money into some projects. But if you want a career and if you want to get to a point where you can express your artistry, you first have to know and, and prove, more importantly prove, that you can actually get the job done in the first place. So is there a way to soften the sellout label? It's, it's been bandied around so much, and I get why people go there, but I feel like sometimes it's, it's overused. My opinion is that like, selling isn't selling out. No? Uh, selling out is sort of when you, um, like you just throw in a towel in a sense. Like you, you how do I say this? Working in a way where you are creating stuff that matches what audiences want is not selling out. You can, look, there's still so much, you know, latitude you can have with a script, with a story, even if you're working in the convention of woman in peril thriller or uh, a aging male action hero film. You know, like there's, that's just, that's an architecture. You know, like the great, I've, I've used this reference before in, in some other interviews I've done, like, like great architects have rules they have to follow. There's gravity. We have to deal with that fact. We have to deal with building codes. We have to deal with the costs of creating the structure. You know, it's not an open-ended budget. The bridge has to serve a function. It can't just be something artistically and architecturally profound. There has to be a purpose for it and there has to be a reason why it's existing. 
Um, what makes it art is what you do with that, how much of yourself you put into that. So getting to a point where you were presenting yourself to the market and saying, I can do this stuff and I can add a spin to it, that's not selling out, that's selling yourself. That's building your career and that's getting you to a point where you're actually going to have clout, you're gonna have connections, you're going to have a track record, you're gonna have a whole history of, of films or projects that you've been associated with that have been successful, commercially viable, and then you can cash in on some of those great connections you have and say, I wanna do something a little bit different. That's why I always go back to the, the gold mine genres. I say don't write drama, don't write comedy. What I mean is don't write them out of the gate. If you have a great idea, keep it on the back burner for a bit because once you build your career and you have connections, you can then take it off and say, look, I know I'm known for this kind of thing, but we have a great relationship and what do you think of this? You now have opened that door to create something fantastic. And look at most of the film directors that are so well renowned today. Look at where they began. I mean, look at how many careers Roger Corman started. You know, it's uh, most great talents, you know, don't rush out of the gate with masterpieces. And Robert Town, who wrote Chinatown, also wrote Days of Thunder. Like, this is just the way it is. It's a business and we all have to pay bills. And uh, selling, selling yourself and being paid for your work and having successful work is nothing to be ashamed of. And frankly, people that feel that way or want to throw that label around probably aren't going to get too far. They're, they're shooting themselves in the foot. Right. Why do you think people go there with that label? I mean, it's, it's easy. I think it's, it's e I think it's really, really easy. I think it's really easy to cut others down. I think it's really easy to call anybody who's doing something that is slightly commercial a sellout, you know, label them because God forbid they might actually become a little bit successful doing it. Um, it I think it's also an easy way to cover up for one's own insecurity about their own work. Uh, I think that happens a lot too. He's a sellout, she's a sellout, you know, whatever. It's like, well, how is your work going to get from point A to point B? <laughs> Frankly, I don't know too many people in boardroom meetings, uh, talents, when they come in to pitch their work, who have a really pissy attitude. I don't really see them get too far. It's usually much more of a collaborative conversation. It's usually much more of a how can we work together? How can we do this? What do you need in the story? Being, being receptive of notes and feedback. You know, those are people that do well in life uh, and do very well in this career. The people that sit there going, no, it's my way or the highway, and you don't have a track record of anything behind you, like who's gonna invest in your project? Frankly, that's just my opinion. Oh, that's a great point. There's probably, uh, there's always an outlier, a one amazing script, it's once in a blue moon, but to be honest, I've never heard of it or seen it. I'll keep my eyes open though. Okay.